The Songa Empire was the third of the great empires in the medieval parts of western sub-Saharan Africa. The Songhai people came to dominate the eastern side of the Niger Bend. Eventually, they developed an empire that covered a vast portion of the western Sudan. In ancient times, several different groups of people combined to form the Songhai. Among the first people in the region of Gao were the Sorko, who established small settlements on the banks of the Niger River. They were specialists in everything that had to do with the river. They built boats and canoes from the wood of the Kaisidarat tree. The Sorko fished and hunted from their boats and provided water transportation for goods and people. A second group that moved into the area to take advantage of the Niger River's resources were hunters known as Go. They specialized in killing river animals such as the crocodile and hippopotamus. The other known group of the time was called the Do. They were farmers who raised crops in the fertile lands that bordered the river. Some time before the 10th century, these early settlers were joined by a more powerful horse riding people who spoke the Songhai language. These herdsmen established control over the other people in the area. All these people together gradually began to speak the language of the Songhai. The dominant Songhai horsemen became recognized as masters of the Eastern Ark of the Niger Bend. The history of how this happened is not clear. Historians will not even have known about the earliest dynasty of kings were it not for an ancient cemetery near a village called Sane near Gao. Inscriptions of a few of the tombstones indicate that the dynasty ruled in the late 11th and early 12th centuries and that its kings had the title Malik which means king in Arabic. Other tombstones mentioned a second dynasty whose rulers had the title Zua but only myths and legends describe Zua's origins. The Arab chroniclers described a mythical figure named Zua Aleman, who is variously described as an Arab from Yemen, a giant from the bush who could run as fast as giraffes and ostriches, or the killer of a monster fish god with a ring on its nose. Among the early people of the Niger Bend region were the camel riding Sanhaja of the Sahara Desert. They were known locally as the Tuareg. They rode out of the Great Desert to establish trading camps near the Niger River. As time went on, Northern African traders crossed the Saharan Desert and joined the Tuareg in their Niger Bend settlement. They all did businesses with the people living near the river. As the trade increased, the Songhai chiefs took control of the profitable commerce. They settled on the left bank of the Niger at the place that came to be known as Gao, which the Arab geographers called Gao Gao. Between 750 and 950 Common Era, while the Ghana Empire was prospering as the land of gold far to the west, the trading center of Gao became an increasingly important southern endpoint for trade across the Saharan Desert. The trade goods included gold, salt, slaves, cola nuts, leather, dates, and ivory. By the 10th century, the Songhai chiefs had taken control of the peoples who lived along the trade routes. Gao was now a small kingdom. By around 1300 Common Era, Gao had become so prosperous that it attracted the attention of the Mali Empire's rulers and was conquered by them. Mali profited from Gao Street and collected taxes from its kings until about the 1430s. But then troubles in the Mali homeland made it impossible for them to maintain control of the distant territories of the Niger Bend. As Mali was becoming weaker, powerful new leadership was rising in Gao. It was about this time that the Zua dynasty was replaced by a new line of rulers who had the title C, short for Sony. In the 1430s, the Mali Empire withdrew from Timbuktu and Gao. The C were then able to take complete control of their own kingdom. Around 1460, C. Suleiman Dema conquered Mema. This was a territory west of the inland delta that had been part of the Mali Empire for centuries. This shows that the Songhai will be able to take over some of the territories that once were on the fringes of the Mali Empire.
When C. Suleiman Dama died in 1464, Ali Beri became the next C of Gao and its surrounding lands. He is popularly known in historiography as Sunni Ali, the conqueror. He was a very ambitious ruler and a military leader with endless energy who was constantly moving around leading his troops to hold off invaders and conquered new territory. C. Ali Beri, where Beri means the great one in the Songhai language, had a large, well provisioned and a disciplined army that included a cavalry. Whenever possible, Sunni Ali or C. Ali also used a fleet of river boats to transport his troops with Soroko crewmen under a naval commander known as the Hikoi. The river navy was very useful because many of C. Ali's military campaigns were in the territories bordering the Niger River. Once C. Ali had cleared the Gao Kingdom of its most immediate dangers, he turned his attention to gaining control of the entire Middle Niger. This included the rich gold and salt trade that passed through Timbuktu and Jene. At the end of 1464, C. Ali Beri arrived with his Songhai army across the river of Timbuktu's port of Kabara. The richest and most powerful Muslims of Timbuktu, which included religious officials, scholars, and wealthy merchants, had been cooperating with the Tuareg people. They all wanted to keep control of the city and keep the city out of Sunni Ali's hands. The Muslims were afraid that if C. Ali Beri succeeded, he would take revenge on those who had died who had sided with the, his enemies. So they prepared a caravan of hundreds of camels for their escape. They fled to Walata, an important commercial city in the Sahara Desert. In January 1464, C. Ali Beri entered Timbuktu. As many had feared, he allowed his troops to loot and burn the city and kill many people. C. Ali's victory over Timbuktu was a milestone in his career as a successful military leader, although a cruel one. With that conquest, he took a major step in turning the small state of Gao into the Songhai Empire. After conquering Timbuktu, C. Ali continued to wage campaigns along the Niger River. He relied heavily on both his cavalry and his river fleet. The third most important city of the Niger Bend was Jene, which was roughly 200 miles southwest upper river of Timbuktu. Jene was the key city of the inland Niger Delta for several centuries. During the golden age of the Mali Empire and in to the period of Songhai expansion. It is said to have been more famous than Timbuktu in medieval times because of the great amount of gold shipped from there to North Africa. Jene enjoyed long periods of political independence. Jene was located in the flat plains between the Bani and the Niger rivers. The entire city, along with some of its farm and farms and cattle herds, were encircled by a high wall. Adding to Jene's security was the fact that for much of the year, when the river was high, it was surrounded by water. Taking advantage of a high water season, C. Ali approached Jene with his fleet of some 400 boats full of soldiers. But the city his defenders were courageous in their resistance and C. Ali's troops found it impossible to get past the city walls. Instead, they circled the city and settled in for a siege, a military tactic in which a city is sealed off so that people, goods, and supplies cannot enter or leave. The aim is to starve the city's inhabitants into surrender. The exact date of C. Ali's attack on Jene are not known, nor is it certain how long the siege lasted. According to legend, the siege was more than seven years, but this is probably an exaggeration. According to descriptions written in the 17th century, C. Ali besieged Jene for four years, which is probably closer to the truth. Eventually, the people of Jene grew weak from farming and agreed to surrender to C. Ali. When they rode out to meet their conqueror, C. Ali was astonished to see how young the chief of Jene was. C. Ali asked if he had been fighting a boy all those years. He was told the young man's father had died during the siege and the son had become the ruler of Jene. C. Ali married the boy's mother and sent her to Gao with rich gifts. C. Ali Beri then set his sights on Walata, the city to which the Muslims fled when he attacked Timbuktu. C. Ali depended on his river boats so much that he wanted to use them for the campaign against Walata even though it was far out in the Sahel where 
there were no natural waterways. So see, Ali's laborers began digging a canal from the town of Ras El Ma at the western end of Lake Fagwebain. From there, it was 120 miles more to Walata. After see, Ali's laborers began digging the canal, he heard that the Mosi ruler of the kingdom of Yatinga in today's Burkina Faso was on the way to attack him. See, Ali abandoned the canal project, marched his army against the Moshi and defeated them. He never did return to the canal project and the conquest of Walata. See, Ali won every battle he fought and conquered every territory he invaded. Thus, Sunni Ali or Si Ali can be considered one of the great conquests of the world. Although the territory he conquered was not as vast as the likes of Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great, he is one of the few military leaders in world history who never lost a battle or failed to conquer a territory he set his sights on. Although, as stated in the Tarihi Sudan, he was a cruel leader and conqueror. His military campaigns set the precedence towards the establishment of the great empire of the Songhai. It is believed that he was the only ruler ever to defeat the people of Jene. The more territory he captured, the more he had to keep traveling to defend and administer his increasingly large empire. The newly conquered people frequently rebelled and hostile neighbors constantly raided the territory now controlled by the Songhai. Perhaps this is because Sunni Ali didn't take his time to establish extensive administration and bureaucracy for ruling his empire as compared to the Mali Empire. In 1492, after holding power for 28 years, C. Ali Beri the Conqueror died while returning home from another military campaign. He was followed by his son, C. Baru. Baru only ruled for five months before he was pushed out by a stronger leader named Askia Muhammad the Great. One of C. Ali's army commanders and provincial governors was Muhammad Turi. He was a righteous Muslim who had objected to C. Ali's brutal treatment of Muslims in Timbuktu. After C. Ali died, Muhammad Turi challenged C. Baru for the leadership of the Songhai Empire. In 1493, after two fierce and bloody battles, Muhammad Turi removed C. Baru, the son of Sunni Ali, and became the king of the Songhai. Askia was a rank in the Songhai army with origins dating from at least the first half of the 13th century. Muhammad Ture took this title as the name of his new dynasty. From that time on, all the kings of the Songhai Empire were referred to as Askia. As one of the greatest of the Songhai rulers, Askia Muhammad Ture strengthened and extended the empire that had begun to take shape under Sunni Ali. He came to be known as Muhammad the Great and created a professional full-time army and built up the Songhai cavalry. He expanded the Songhai control far beyond the territories of the Middle Niger and the inland delta waterways that had been conquered by C. Ali Beri. Under Askia Muhammad, the Songhai Empire established lands in which the kings paid tribute. These extended northwards to the salt pans of Tagaza in the Sahara Desert, westward to many of the former territories of the Mali Empire, and eastwards to the Tuareg Kingdom of Agadez. The empire grew so large that its army was divided into two parts one for the western provinces based in Timbuktu and one for the eastern provinces based in Gao. Two 17th century Timbuktu chronicles name 37 sons that Askia Muhammad had with various wives and concubines. The concubine is a woman who is supported by a man and lives with him without being legally married to him. The practice of concubinage or the harem was done by several kings of different empires in the world. The Abbasid Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Mughal Empire, and so on. Askia Muhammad Ture might have even had more children than that. The total number of his male and female children is said to have been around 471. The sons were mostly half brothers, related only through their father. These rival brothers, as they were called, did not have the kind of close attachment to one another that might be felt by brothers who had the same mother, known as milk brothers. As these rival brothers grew 
grew up, they became involved in bloody power struggles. When Askia Muhammad Toure was about 70 years old, he found it difficult to control his sons. He was physically weak and they pressured him to retire so that one of them could become the emperor or Askia. The royal courts of the Songhai became a dangerous place for Askia Muhammad even though the rebels were his own sons. The oldest of his sons living in Gao was Musa. He was the leader of the brothers who were trying to bring about a change in rulership. At this time, Ali Fulan, master of the royal household, would not allow anyone to see Askia Muhammad Turi in person. This further angered Musa. What the sons did not know was that Ali Fulan was hiding the fact that Askia Muhammad Turi had gone blind. Finally, in 1529, Musa publicly de demanded that the power be given to him. The elderly and blind Askia Muhammad had no powerful supporters, so he gave in to his son and stepped down as king. Musa became the Askia of Songhai, although his father lived another 10 years. Once Musa became king, he started killing his rival brothers one by one. Many fled to Walata, Timbuktu, and other towns. The killing continued for two years until 1531. Then some of the surviving brothers joined together and killed Askia Musa in a bloody battle. The reign of Askia Musa lasted only two years and eight months. After killing Askia Musa, the brothers returned to Gao. They expected their leader to be the next Askia. But when they got there, they found their cousin, Muhammad Bonkanka, already sitting on the throne. Askia Bonkanka is remembered for decorating the Songhai court with splendid furnishings, introducing new kinds of musical instruments, and providing his courtiers with imported clothing. He humiliated the daughters of Askia Muhammad by forcing them to appear at court with their faces uncovered. According to their Muslim beliefs, this showed that the sisters were impure. Askia Bonkanka further insulted Askia Muhammad and all his sons by having the court storyteller continually repeat quote a single ostrich chick is better than a hundred hen chicks unquote everyone knew this meant the son of umar komadiaha bonkanka's father is worthy more than hundred sons of askia muhammad when askia bonkanka took power askia muhammad was still living in the royal palace but askia bonkanka sent him to be imprisoned on a mosquito infested island in the niger river near the city askia bonkanka had been friends with ismail one of askia muhammad's sons since childhood Ismail had fled when Musa started killing all his brothers. Now Askia Bonkanka wanted his cousin to join him in Gao. However, because Ismail actually had a stronger claim to the throne, Askia Bonkanka was concerned for his own safety. So, when Ismail arrived, the king had him swear on the Quran that Ismail would never betray him. As an extra precaution, Askia Bonkanka had his daughter Fati marry Ismail. So his cousin was now also his son-in-law. One night, Ismail went to visit his father where he was imprisoned. The blind man took hold of his son's arm and asked him why. With such strong arms, he was leaving his father to be eaten by mosquitoes and croaked at by frogs. Ismail replied that he had no power to do anything, but his father convinced him to contact powerful allies who would help. In 1537, while Askia Bonkanka was away on a military campaign, Ismail overthrew him. Askia Ismail released his father from the island and brought him back to the palace. In gratitude, Askia Muhammad Duri, the Great, presented Askia Ismail with a ceremonial clothing that went with the high Muslim office of Caliph. A green robe, green cap, white turban, and the Arabian sword that Muhammad had been given on pilgrimage to Mecca when he was the Askia. Muhammad lived into his 90s and died in 1538 during Askia Ismail's reign. Askia Ismail reigned for two years and nine months and died a natural death in November 1539. When the leading men of the Songhai Empire heard about Askia Ismail's death, they peacefully agreed that the next Askia would be Ishaq, another son of Muhammad the Great. Of all the Askias, it was Askia Ishaq who inspired the most fear and anxiety among the Songhai people. Despite being a devout Muslim, Askia Ishaq regularly sent agents to Timbuktu to demand large sums of money from the merchants. Islam prohibits bribery and demands for money. Fearing for their lives, nobody dared 
dared complain. The amount of money demanded was so great that it damaged the economic prosperity of the Songa Empire and gained as Kiai's hack many enemies. He began to fear that he would be overthrown. Anyone who was suspected of opposing him was quickly dismissed or killed. In 1549, when it became known that as Kiai's hack was dying, his brother Dawood went to visit a Songai sorcerer called a Sohanshi. Some people believe that the Sohanshi worked ma a magic spell that eliminated Dawood's chief rival. Whether or not this is true, Dawood became the next Askia. Together with C. Ali Berry and Askia Muhammad, Askia Dawood is remembered as the third of the Songhai Empire's greatest rulers. The empire remained stable and prosperous under his rule. Upon up to this time, all of the Askias had been the sons of Muhammad, with the exception of Muhammad Bonkanka, who was a nephew. Many other sons of Askia Muhammad had held high offices and titles. During the 34-year reign of Askia Dawood, as these important offices became vacant, he usually appointed his own sons to the positions. In this way, Askia Dawood gradually eliminated from high office the descendants of the other sons of Askia Muhammad. From Askia Dawood's time forward, all the Askias were his descendants. Nevertheless, after his death in 1582, warfare broke out among the brothers competing for power. The winner was Askia Muhammad al Hajj. He is notably different from the other Songhai rulers because he never organized a military campaign. Soon after he took power, he developed a painful medical condition on the lower part of his body that kept him from leading his troops. He also never killed any of his brothers. But after nearly four and a half years, they became impatient with his poor health. In 1586, Askia Al-Hajj was replaced by his brother, Muhammad Bani. Al-Hajj died soon thereafter. When Muhammad Bani became Askia, one of his brothers complained that the most foolish of their brother's sons had become ruler. This brother and several others who had agreed with him were killed by Muhammad Bani as soon as he was in power. During Askia Bani's reign, the town of Kabara was the scene of the event that led to a civil war. This war eventually spelled disaster for the Songa Empire. Kabara is Timbuktu's port on the Niger River. Two of the most powerful men in Songhai lived there. One was Alu, the chief of the port, and the other was Muhammad Sadiq, the military commander. Sadiq was a son of Askia Dawood and was popular with the leading men of Timbuktu. Alu was an officer in service of Askia Bani. The Timbuktu historian Ibn al Mukhtar describes Alu as an oppressor and a stubborn tyrant. In 1588, Alu whipped and jailed one of Sadiq's men. Sadiq responded by killing Alu. Sadiq took all of Alu's property and declared a revolt against Askia Bani. Accompanied by other Songhai commanders, Sadiq began to march the army towards Gao. The Songhai historian Abdurrahman Asadi, in his Tariq al Sudan, History of the Sudan, wrote that when the Askia heard they were coming, he said, May God curse kinship, for it is the source of humiliation and degradation. Askia Bani set out from Gao with his army to battle with Sadiq and stopped in the midway to take a up. The Askia was overweight and was wearing a cloak of chainmail, an armor made of closely linked metal wires. During the hottest part of the day, when his servants came to wake him to get ready for the midday prayer, he found him dead of a heart attack. The next descendant of Askia Dawood to take the throne was Ishaq. He became known as Askia Ishaq II. His immediate problem was that the people of Timbuktu were still loyal to Sadiq. With Askia Bani now dead, Sadiq wanted to overthrow the new Askia and grab power for himself. Sadiq's army swore loyalty to him and were therefore in revolt against Askia Ishaq II. Sadiq was so popular with the people of Timbuktu that they held a celebration in his honor that included beating drums on the roof tops of the buildings in Timbuktu. When Askia Ishaq II learned what was happening, the armies of Timbuktu and Gao met in battle. Sadiq was defeated and he and all of the Songhai Empire who had joined him in his rebellion were captured and put to death. There were so many executions that Songhai lost many of its finest military commanders. Hundreds of soldiers on both sides had also been killed in the battle. Askia Ishaq II appointed new commanders but he could not replace the dead troops. Sadiq's rebellion had 
caused the loss of a large portion of the Songhai army. At the end of 1590, as here is II received news that an army from Morocco was on its way to attack Songhai. He assembled his newly appointed commanders to discuss plans for their defense against the Moroccan threat, but they could not agree on a strategy, and so Songhai was not prepared to meet the approaching invaders. Al Sadi and Ibu Mukhtar, two 17th century Timbuktu historians, tell a story that may or may not be true about an incident leading to the Moroccan invasion of the Songhai Empire. It is claimed that sometime in 1589, a slave born in the Songhai royal house named Wult Kirinfel was imprisoned at Takhaza in the Sahara. The slave escaped and fled to Marrakesh in Morocco, where he claimed to be a brother of Askia Ishaq II. Wult Kirimfil supposedly wrote a letter to the Moroccan Sultan, Maulay Ahmed Al Mansur, encouraging him to invade Songhai. Al Mansur wrote to his Hag the Second, demanding, among other things, payment of one mythkal, a measure of units of gold, as a task on every camel loading of salt to leave the mines of Tagaza. These salt mines were in disputed territory halfway between Songhai and Morocco. As his Hag the Second sent an insulting reply, accompanied by a spear and a pair of iron sandals. The iron sandals meant that until the day Al Mansur wore out those sandals, Askia Ishaq II would never agree to these demands. The idea was that since the sandals were made of iron, they would never be worn out. And thus began a series of events and decisions that led to the invasion of the Songhai Empire by the Moroccans and the eventual collapse of the Songhai Empire. Even before the escaped slave had contacted Al Mansur, the Sultan was aware that Songhai could be a source of gold, slaves, and other riches because he had a spy living in Gao for several years. Al Mansur used Ishaq's challenge as an excuse to send an expedition to attack Songhai. Al Mansur chose as his commander Jawdar Pasha. Pasha is a word that denotes high rank or office. Jawdar was an Islamic convert of Spanish origin. The Moroccan army set out at at the end of 1590 with about 4,000 fighting men including some 2,000 foot soldiers with muskets, a type of light gun with a long barrel, 500 muskets riding horses, 1,500 Arab spearmen and 70 Christian slaves armed with a portable big gun. Some of the Moroccan troops probably wore chain mail armor which was introduced to the Western Sudan about the same time as firearms. It took about 10,000 camels to carry all the invading army supplies. These included four small cannons, 10 mortars for shooting stone balls into towns. They also had to carry large quantities of gunpowder, tents, and other supplies for the troops and enough food and water to last them for a journey of at least 40 days across the Sahara Desert. When the Songhai heard the Moroccans were coming, one of the Askia's commanders suggested they send soldiers to fill in the desert wells to deprive the invading army of water. Instead, Askia Ishaq II sent messengers to ask Tuareg chiefs to fill in the wells. Not only did the Tuareg lack any loyalty to Songhai, but the messengers could not even get through because they were attacked by bandits. Jordan Pasha's troops found the wounded messengers in the desert still carrying the Askia's message. The Songhai leadership failed to act quickly. The Moroccans crossed the Sahara and then took two weeks to recover from their exhausting desert journey. The decisive battle took place on March the 12th, 1591, near Tondibi, which is 30 miles north of Gao on the Niger River. The Songhai suffered heavy losses and retreated across the Niger River. They were shielded 
by courageous troops who protected their rear and fought to the death. As Kiyahishag II then tried to buy off the Moroccan invaders, he offered Jaldar Pasha a tribute of 100,000 gold pieces and 1,000 slaves, hoping this would satisfy the Moroccans and that they would leave Songhai. By this time, the Moroccan troops were exhausted and ill. Jaldar Pasha was prepared to accept the tribute and retreat back across the desert. However, back in Marrakesh, Al Mansur decided he wanted to retain control of the new, newly conquered land below the desert. He rejected Askeishak's offer and replaced Jaldar with Mahmoud Pasha. Mahmoud had instructions to complete the conquest of Songhai. The Moroccans occupied and looted Timbuktu, Gao, and Jene. They sent the wealth of these cities back to their capital of Marrakesh, where it was used to build fine palaces. What remained of the Songhai army retreated into the countryside. They rebelled against Askia Ishaq II and placed Mahmoud Muhammad Gao on the throne. But Askia Muhammad Gao unwisely accepted an invitation to visit Mahmoud Pasha and was assassinated. Led by Askiano, a brother of Mahmoud Gao, the Songhai continued their resistance to the Moroccan occupation. For two years, they fought small but successful ambushes against Mahmoud Pasha and his troops until Mahmoud finally gave up and returned to Timbuktu. Nur fought until 1599, but the Moroccans continued to occupy Timbuktu and other urban centers. The Songhai leaders were never able to recover their empire. The great cities of the former Songhai Empire were under Moroccan control. They did not take long for the people who had been conquered by the Songhai to assert their independence and began raiding one another. In the early 17th century, Tuareg nomads of the Sahara became, began making raids into the great bend of the, of the Niger River. The cattle herding Fulani of the inland delta formed their own state called Masina and began attacking their neighbors. Bamana warriors from upriver southwest of Songhai laid siege to Jene and fought with the Fula armies. Armies from kingdoms in present-day northern Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso also began advancing into southern regions of the former empire. By the 18th century, the former heartland of the Songhai Empire was occupied by several small states and this marks the end of the great empire of the Songhai. At this time, colonial powers were also gaining a foothold through trade in the sub-Saharan part of Africa. Hence, the hope for the comeback of the Songhai was lost and the empire ceased to exist. Today, the former territories of the Songa Empire is spread across the countries of the Sahel in the western parts of the African continent. If you enjoyed the video, like and comment on the channel's videos and if you are new to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Thank you.